Hello and welcome to the Just and Sinner podcast. I am your host, Dr. Jordan Cooper. Thank you so much for joining me once again, as always, on the program today. And just want to give you all a quick reminder that Justin Sinner as an organization is supported by donors. So we would ask that you consider becoming a regular contributor of Justin Sinner. You can go to justincenter.org, go to our donate page and give either a one-time gift or you can give a regular monthly or quarterly donation. You can sign up through DonorBox uh, or Patreon and... Uh, when you do sign up, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, which means that any gifts that you give us are tax deductible. <clears throat> well, uh, on the program today, uh, I am going to do something that I don't generally like to do, and that is base my discussion on something that happened on Twitter. <laughs> so, uh, I, and, and I tell people tell me all the time, don't do that. Don't be one of these guys that just talks about Twitter drama. And Twitter is is a, a terrible website, but. Um, I, I wanted to address something that kind of blew up over the last week and a half. Uh, this was, let's see, well, it was December 22nd. I'm looking at the date here. So it was about two weeks ago. I got sick with the flu and I was in bed and, uh, and I'm still recovering by the way. I'm recording at the end of this week. It's been like two weeks of sickness. It's kind of awful. Um, but while I was laying in bed, uh, sick, I saw that there was a discourse going on uh, about the nature of Christ's presence in the sacrament of the altar. And in particular, I saw a, a Roman Catholic who was interacting with some Lutherans, and the Roman Catholic was, was, I think, misrepresenting a Lutheran perspective and said that Lutherans believe in a physical presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And this is a, a Roman Catholic who knows the scholastic terminology, understands what physical means in this particular context. And so I responded by tweeting out a clarification to try to say that w when we say real presence, we don't mean physical presence. So here's the tweet, and I've got my, my phone here, so we'll just read what I said. I said, apparently there's discourse on here about the Lutheran doctrine of communion. <laughs> We do not believe in a physical presence or a, quote, local presence. It is a real presence and a, quote, substantial presence, but a mysterious one. So the, the terms that I used here were precise terms. These are precise terms that Lutheran theologians have used basically forever since the Lutheran church has existed. These actually even precede Luther, some of these distinctions. And... To be honest, when I had tweeted this, I did not expect there to be any controversial pushback or anything, maybe some clarification about what I mean by physical. This was followed up uh, by a number of citations and quotes from the Formula of Concord and Charles Krauth and Heinrich Schmid. So I, I put a bunch of other things up on Twitter to clarify what the term physical actually means. And I don't think any of the critics of the tweet actually looked at any of the follow-up tweets, of course. <laughs> uh, and and this, this ended up leading to some very bizarre accusations uh, toward me, including a, a, another Lutheran pastor calling me a sophist and then a, a Lutheran podcast not naming me by name, but they were doing so on Twitter, so it was clearly what it was a response to. Uh, basically making the claim that I am uh, not apt to teach because I use too many precise categories and therefore I'm not qualified to be a pastor. I mean, that was the argument, which I thought was absolutely absurd. But, um, it, you know, it would be nice if a pastor that I'm in fellowship with would actually, like, you know, contact me or something if they have concerns about something that, that I'm saying. Um and it, it was a this podcast was it was very bizarre. I did listen to it. A number of people pointed me to it, and it was it was basically a very anti intellectualism kind of don't use any categories because they're too confusing. These are categories in our confessions, and that our theologians have have always used. I thought I was it sounded like I was listening to a, an independent fundamental Baptist response to something that was basically like, well, if you can't preach it to the old lady who's dying, then you can't talk about it or something. It was very very bizarre. So uh, because of that, I'm like, I guess I've got to address this issue because it blew up to the point that people are talking about this on like other podcasts. And, and so I, I've gotten myself into controversies before. And, and sometimes, yeah, things I've said maybe have been a bit controversial or I could understand why they would be. Uh, this is just completely non-controversial. I mean, I'm telling you that the categories that I'm using here are things that Lutherans have always used. They're distinctions in our confessions. This is not controversial. It shouldn't be controversial for anybody who knows our doctrine and history. But 
here we are. So I've got to deal with this. Uh, I, I don't really want to be talking about this, uh, but since I'm accused of heresy and, and leading people astray and all these other things for using categories of our confessions, I guess maybe I have to actually talk about it. So, all right. So let's see. what What's the point under discussion here? Now, um, as Lutherans, obviously we believe in the real presence. And there are different ways to, terms to use to speak about the real presence. Sacramental presence, uh, the real presence of Christ, uh, the sacramental union. And when, you know, this is kind of the distinctive feature of, of Lutheran uh, Protestantism over against, you know, the Reformed, Reformed Protestantism or, or most other, you know, American evangelicals who do not believe that there is is that the body and blood of Christ is actually substantially present within the sacrament of the altar. Uh, and so we do believe that what we receive in Holy Communion is the actual body of Christ. It is the actual blood of Christ. And when these, when Luther spoke, he's, and it's, Luther spoke very clearly about the, his real his sacramental realism, meaning that uh, when Jesus used the words of institution and said, this is my body uh, and this is my blood, that he actually meant that it was his body and that it was his blood. Uh, now, of course, you know, if you know the history of, of the Reformation and the history of, of various Reformation movements, uh, we had a response from Ulrich Zwingli, who ends up becoming really the father of the Reformed Church, especially through through Calvin, really, but but Zwingli can be in some ways said to be the first Reformed uh, theologian. Zwingli objected to Luther's presentation uh, and argued that uh, the words of institution were not to be taken in a literal sense, uh, but this is my body essentially meant this represents my body. There were a number of other takes among those who rejected a sacramental realism about what part of that sentence is symbolic, but we're not going get, to get into all of those uh, those distinctions. Um, but the point is that uh, Zwingli then started to argue against Luther's Christology. And he makes the argument that Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. Of course, we confess that in the Creed, that Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. And Zwingli said, well, if Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father, uh, therefore Christ cannot be present on the altar. Because aren't we confessing if this is really his body and blood, that his body and blood are present in all of these places at once. So all these churches throughout the world celebrate the sacrament of the altar all at once. Uh, and that means from a Lutheran perspective, Christ's, Christ's body is ubiquitous. And we'll talk about that term ubiquity, which is really a reformed term to characterize the Lutheran view rather than a, than a Lutheran term. Uh, and so they argue, well, the, the Lutherans have this faulty Christology because you believe that the body of Christ is is not actually at the right hand of the Father, that it's like kind of stretched out through all, all the heavens and it's this infinite body. Uh, and in response, and I've been doing a whole series of podcasts on Christology, I just did two dealing with this particular question uh, related to the Reformed. In response, the Lutherans say that there is a communication of attributes. Uh, there's a communication of the divine attributes to the human nature so that the kinds of human limitations that an ordinary person would have, such as a limitation of a physical presence, uh, a limitation of presence at the right hand of, in one particular locale, like my body, my physical body is stuck in one place. I don't have a human nature in any way that is uh, beyond this particular location. Um, but we would say that because of the union of natures, in the exaltation and glorification of the humanity of Christ, there is an ability of his body to be present where God says that his body is, uh, so that we don't have to apply limitations of ordinary humanity in our fallen state in terms of location. We don't have to apply those to Jesus. And in response to Luther then, Zwingli, and a lot of later Calvinists as well, started to portray Luther's doctrine of the Lord's Supper in the most crude manner possible. So they started saying things like, well, you believe that you're literally tearing Jesus apart with your teeth when you eat him. And that is, uh, you're basically cannibals. Um, you know, you're, you're eating, G believe you're eating Jesus in the way that you eat a steak or something. And so the accusation toward Lutherans is you believe that there is this carnal presence, or sometimes the language physical presence is used to describe how it is that Jesus is present in the sacrament. Now, 
Lutherans never really wanted to attempt to just give some kind of in-depth philosophical explanation of how it is that Christ is present in the sacrament. In, in many ways, it would have been much better if we could just say, and as Luther wanted to say, the words of Christ are true. When he says it's his body, it's his body. When he says it's his blood, it's his blood. And, and, and we don't want to go far beyond that in making all sorts of explanations of exactly how this works, which is precisely the problem that, that we've had with the doctrine of transubstantiation. Is, is really that transubstantiation tries to explain too much. It gets too specific about what the mode of transformation is and exactly how it works. Uh, whereas we're willing to just say, well, it is the body and blood of Christ. It's a mystery in terms of how, of how it is, but it is a body and blood of Christ. However, very early on, because of some of these caricatures of the Lutheran view, some of the critiques of the Reformed particularly, Lutherans started to, to get a little more specific about the mode of presence. The reason they did this was not to just overly philosophize and give you know, exact means by which Christ is present according to his body and blood, but into, instead to clarify what the sacramental presence is not. And so when we look at these conversations of mode of presence, we really need to see them much more in a negative sense, uh, much more in the sense that not what they're doing is trying to give some exact presentation of the mode of presence. They reject that, which is why Lutherans reject the idea of consubstantiation, reject impanation, reject transubstantiation, because these are all attempts to explain philosophically the, with precision how this works. I would think of this more like what you find with the Chalcedonian definition of Christology, is when we're talking about the relationship between the two natures in Christ, we don't know exactly what it means that a divine nature has assumed a human nature. Because we don't even know what a divine nature is. Right? We often define God uh, apophatically, meaning we define God often by what he is not, that he does not have creaturely limitations. Not that we don't have any cataphatic or positive words to use, because we do to speak about God, um, and we do so analogically. But when we're talking about uh, the sacrament, we're doing something similar as to say, just like you say, well, that there are two natures, but they're without confusion, without division, without a mixture. We're, we're trying to define what they are not because when false views show up, you have to start to put boundaries around, around orthodoxy to say, well, this is what we don't mean. So when Lutherans start doing this in terms of mode of presence, more than saying this is exactly what we do mean or what does happen in terms of how the body and blood of Christ are present in the sacrament, we're more setting boundaries around to say, don't go outside of these boundaries. What we are saying is not this. <laughs> okay, so that's important background to, to have in mind historically to say, why is it that Lutherans started making these distinctions? And it's really because of false accusations about what Lutherans believe that led them to make these distinctions, which is exactly what I did on t Twitter, <laughs> which was, well, it was a, a someone who's not Lutheran. Uh, and, and I think, I don't think he was trying to misrepresent Lutherans. I think he was just seeing what Lutherans were saying. And he, from his Roman Catholic perspective, understands the term physical in a particular way and starts to say, wait, is this what Lutherans believe? And I come in and in that conversation and say, no, this is not, this is not what Lutherans believe when we're talking about um, the real presence. So the, the first thing I want to do as we start talking about this is just to look at our Lutheran confessions, uh, because one thing you find is that, and I'm using the reader's edition here, that is probably the most common one that most of you have. Um, but, and I'm using this edition precisely because a lot of you can actually look up these references yourself, because I know it's the one that most of you have. Uh, so this, the distinctions that we see do show up in our confessions between different modes of presence. So this is a confessional teaching. That means that if you are an ordained pastor within um, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod or the AALC or another confessional Lutheran Church body, you have taken vows to uphold the teaching of these documents. And that doesn't mean that you get to ignore some of the teachings in these documents because you think they're too hard or think they're too confusing to people. You subscribe to them and you made a vow to teach according to those documents. So you don't get to criticize somebody else for teaching according to those documents, which is what you're supposed to do too. Okay, so um, I, what I have here, I'm going to read from, this is the Formula of Concord, the Solid Declaration, Article 7. Um, and this is beginning in 98. Now, this is a section that is discuss, discussing the nature of Christ's body and the sacrament. 
um, trying to make some distinctions between what we're saying and what someone like Ulrich Zwingli is going to say about the body of Christ. And this here is a quotation from Martin Luther. So this is not something that's invented post-Luther. Luther actually takes this from, uh, from I believe, William of Ockham. Or is it Dunscotus? <laughs> now I'm forgetting. There, there's a, an article that I've read, and I can correct this in the future or link to the article. Um, making the point that, and I've argued many times Luther was not a nominalist, but there are some categories from those teachers that he grabs onto. And one of those is the category of modes of presence. So this doesn't even start with Luther. I mean, this is pre-Luther, but Luther uses these distinctions when he's in this debate with Zwingli. Um, so here's what, what our confessions say, quoting Luther. Thus, the one body of Christ has a threefold existence or all three modes of being at a given place. So what he's going to do is distinguish between these various modes of presence. Now, what, what the Reformed are going to say in response to this is, well, if you just, you're just making up these scholastic categories, you're just, you're just making up a distinction between modes of presence. Where does the Bible make a distinction between modes of presence? You're just importing these categories into the text. And I, I push back against that and say that I think by the words of Scripture themselves, we are bound to say that there are different ways that Christ can be present. And I don't think that's just a philosophical construct. So, you know, the example that I give most often is Jesus is about to depart right at the ascension. Clearly, he's in some way, the body of Jesus is not there. There's some way that he's not present. But then he says, behold, I will be with you always, even unto the end of the age. So, in the words of Jesus themselves, at the moment of ascension, we have two different ways of Christ being present. So, in some way, he's not there, in that they can't physically see, grab, or touch him. I mean, that's just kind of obvious. But in some way, he says, I'm always with you here. And then we just have the words of the supper, which are, this is my body. So, in some way, this is Jesus' body. This is my blood. In some way, it's his blood. As Paul says to the Corinthians, we share in the body of Christ, the blood of Christ. If you sin in the sacrament of the altar, you are sinning actually against the body of Christ, meaning that is the body of Christ here given for you, so you sin against it. So, we're just trying to take the entirety of what Scripture says about the presence of Christ and hold on to it. And we're not making really particular differentiations to say, well, I know what the difference between this or that mode of presence is. We're just saying, well, Scripture says he's gone because he ascended. Visibly, they saw that. Scripture says he's always present with the church because Scripture says that Jesus says that too. And then we're also told that somehow his body and blood are here in the sacrament. So we have those three modes of presence just in the New Testament text itself. So we're not just creating these categories. What we're doing is trying to say we want to affirm everything that the that the Scripture says, especially you know in various New Testament texts about the body of Christ. And we have these three realities that somehow we've got to fit together. So we talk about them as three modes of presence. So we're not reading that into the text. We're trying to take out of the text what's what's already there. That in these three ways. There is a presence, but also in one sense, an absence. Um, okay, so Luther says, there are these three modes of presence. So first, he says, first, the circumscribed corporeal mode of presence. And so corporeal here is what is often translated as physical. So if you look at like uh, Kohler, who's a, a standard introduction to theology within the LCMS, he uses the term physical. Uh, Charles Krauth uses the term physical as th they use this term physical as a, a stand in for cor corporeal. So that's what they mean. When I say there's no physical presence, just like many Lutherans have writing in English, <laughs> use the term physical as a stand in for corporeal. That's what I mean. So the circumscribed corporeal mode of presence, as when he walked bodily on the earth, when he occupied and yielded space according to his size. So he's saying that this is where he actually occupies space, like physical things do. So when we say that the mode is not corporeal or physical, which is the term that I used, if you're saying it's not physical, we're just saying it doesn't take up space in the way that an ordinary body does. And I know that in our, and this is really what I think the problem is, people are so influenced by a kind of post-enlightenment rationalistic approach to the world that we can't think of something as being really here if it's not here in physical space. 
Like we, we tend to see reality as that which is purely matter, right? Physical, physical meaning you can, you can literally touch it and feel it. It literally takes up space. So that, that tends to be the way that we think about presence in our very kind of post enlightenment, very scientific view of the world. But that's not how ancient people understood this. That's why there isn't this big outcry when they say it's not a corporeal or physical presence in the history of the Lutheran Church. There's, there's no big outcry against this because people 500 years ago understood that you can have a body that is there without being there in the sense of having physical mass in front of you that you can touch and see. So the, the, there's an analogy sometimes used uh, to describe this, which is, well, we understand the mode of the angel's presence. Um, so the, the angels don't physically take up space. And it doesn't mean that the angels aren't present anywhere. But when an angel is present, he's not taking up space in the way that a physical being takes up space. So in some mysterious way, even the body of Christ can be present in this way. Even though it is a real body and it is real blood, it can be present in this mysterious way, whatever that means. Okay. So, as when he walked bodily on earth, he occupied and yielded space according to his size. He can still employ this mode of presence when he wills to do so, as he did after his resurrection, and as he will do on the last day. As Paul says in 1 Timothy, whom the blessed God will reveal in Colossians 3, 4, when Christ your life reveals himself. <laughs> so, th this is not, when he has this corporeal mode of presence, uh, what what Luther is, is not saying is what Zwingli would say, which is that means that his, this corporeal, ordinary mode of presence is limited. And that it has to act in every ordinary way that a normal, natural human body does. You know, I think about the return of Christ. I mean, it, it seems like there's something going on with the presence of Christ that somehow when he returns in the sky, everyone can see him from all around the globe unless you believe the earth is flat, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but like that physically is an impossibility if it's a physical normal body. Well, I, something miraculous is going on there, but yes, he can use that physical body. However, he, he desires to. Okay. And then Luther says he is not in God or with the father or in heaven, according to this mode as this mad spirit dreams for God is not a corporeal space or place. The passages which the spiritualists adduce concerning Christ leaving the world and going to the Father speak of this mode of presence. So clearly he's writing against Zwingli, which is what's forming the categories that he's using. So then we have the second mode of presence. So he says, secondly, the uncircumcised spiritual mode of presence. And we have to be careful about that language of spiritual presence because the reformed start to abuse what spiritual means so if you're going to say is our confessions do speak about the body and blood of christ being present spiritually but what they don't mean is non-bodily and that's how they're reformed to take it so uh, it doesn't tend to be the case that lutherans are too happy saying that he's spiritually present because it's pretty much always misunderstood because the Reformed start using the language of spiritual presence to mean something else. So it's fine to use the term spiritual because it's in our confessions. Just explain what you mean by spiritual when you use it to say, and not this. Because that's what you find in someone like Krauth, uh, who's going to comment on the confessions is to say, you know, it is spiritual, but this is what we mean by it. And I think that's just, that's important to do. Okay, so second, the uncircumcised spiritual mode of presence, according to which he neither occupies nor yields space. So he doesn't take up space in the way that normal matter does, but passes through everything created as he wills. To use some crude illustrations, and you see this, this illustration shows up over and over again. My vision passes through and exists in the air, light or water, and does not occupy or yield any space. Right? So I see things, in a, what, what I see with my vision is taking up space. So in, in some way, it's not... You know, I can see in front of me. I can see out my window, and I can see into the you know the next closest house to mine. However, my physical eyes are not actually literally physically occupying the entire space between my house and the house in front of me. I would look very strange if I was doing that. Um, okay, so he says, or think about a sound. A sound or a tone passes through and exists in air, water, or a board in a wall, and neither occupies nor yields space. 
uh, or light. He says light and heat go through the air. You know, my I have a lamp right in front of me right here that you can't see because it's putting light on me so you all can somewhat see my face as I'm talking here. Um, but even though the light physically, like the light fixture is in one physical location, the light itself fills the room. So it goes beyond just that one uh, little space. Okay, heat exists in air, water, glass, crystal, and the like, but without occupying or yielding space, and many more like these. He employed this mode of presence when he left the closed grave and came through closed doors, in the bread and wine and the supper, and, as people believe, when he was born in his mother. <laughs> there you go. There is... there <laughs> that That's the confessional distinction. So this is exactly what I was saying. He's saying that the, the physical body of Christ is not here in that there is no corporeal body that takes up literal space. But we do receive mysteriously, sacramentally, the true body and blood of Christ. So he does call it uh, an uncircumcised and spiritual mode of presence. Again, I think spiritual ends up becoming very unhelpful because the Reformed means something totally different by spiritual presence, which makes it confusing because then it makes it sound like the Lutherans and Reformed are saying the same thing, and we're not. Um, so, you know, he, he's using this same uh, distinction to talk about the way that Christ is not limited to the rules of physical or physicality like when he walks through a wall. He walks through a closed door. It's still his body, but it's not physical in the sense that it doesn't have the same physical limitations that a regular human body does. He can just walk through a wall if he feels like it. Anyway, he does plenty of physical things with that body. He eats and swallows, but it's not a physical body in the same sense that an ordinary human body is. Um, so really, it, it's in our confessions, exactly what I was saying. It's a substantial mode of presence is what I said, not physical or local. Uh, and the language of it not being a local presence is the one that you'll see showing up over and over and over again, and that again comes from Luther. Okay, so the third point. Thirdly, since he is one person with God, the divine heavenly mode, according to which all created things are indeed much more permeable and present to him than they are according to the second mode. For if according to the second mode, he can be present in and with created things in such a way that they do not feel, touch, measure, or circumscribe him, in the sense that, like, even though I believe Christ is present in the sacrament of the altar, in the Eucharist, I cannot, you know, take the host and, you know, extract the DNA of Jesus from it. That doesn't mean he's not actually present when I receive it, but it's not subject to the ordinary laws of physical nature. So that's what he's saying here. Okay. How much more marvelously will he be present in all created things according to this exalted third mode where they cannot measure or circumscribe him, but where they are present to him so that he measures and circumscribes them. You must place this existence of Christ, which constitutes him one person with God far, far beyond things created, as far as God transcends them. And on the other hand, place it as deep in and as near to all created things as God is in them. For he is one indivisible person with God, and wherever God is, he must be also otherwise our faith is false all right so <laughs> again this this shows what is the concern for just what scripture says because what does scripture say that you know he he who descended in ephesians is the one who ascended who now fills all things so luther is trying to grab onto this idea that's scriptural that he fills all things. Like, we live and move and have our being in him, and that includes the God-man, so the one who is both God and man. And, and this has been a Reformed criticism, that, well, if you say Christ is present everywhere, then what's so special about the sacrament? Because any piece of bread you eat is the body and blood of Jesus. Clearly, there's something distinct about how we receive his body and blood in the sacrament. So that's why we have to make now this distinction between these two modes of presence, because the Reformed force us to. Because the Reformed start to say that, oh, well, you're just saying he's present everywhere. So if he's present everywhere, that means you receive him when you eat your breakfast cereal in the morning. So to say, no, obviously there's something different in how he gives himself in the sacrament that is different from the sense that he's generally present everywhere. So we're forced to make this distinction between modes of presence. So the distinction between modes of presence are, are just ones that we kind of have to make. We were forced into making those because of the criticisms leveled toward our, our approach. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, 
Okay, so let, let me look at, I'm moving to 103 here. I'm going to skip just a tiny bit of this. And I'm spending most time in our confessions because that's what's most important. But I want to look at, I have a whole stack of books with quotes about this to show this is just universal. I mean, this is everywhere. Like every, like every Lutheran makes this distinction. Okay, it shows up in Chemnitz, it shows up in Jacob Andre, it uh, shows up in uh, Hunius, it shows up in Hollatz and Kalov and Quenstedt, it shows up in Gerhard, it shows up in Walther and in Pieper. I mean, look at any significant Lutheran theologian from Luther until today, and they all make this distinction. Maybe not some ones living today that aren't very careful, but those who are consistently attuned to our confessions and part of our confessional tradition, they all make the same distinction. It's not controversial. It shouldn't be controversial. This is just stated blatantly in the entirety of our tradition. And, and I think this just goes to show something that I've consistently said, that Lutherans today are so divorced from our confessional tradition. And the fact that that's so surprising to me, which it shouldn't be that surprising nowadays because it just seems to show up over and over again, is that it's the same individuals who just claim that they're the most confessional Lutherans and they're critiquing everybody for not being confessional enough. And those are the same individuals that will deny distinctions in our confessions when you bring them up because they don't actually know our confessions. And, and it doesn't matter if you're confessional, if you just if the only thing you care about is how closed your communion is uh, and you want to beat people over the head with that as if that's just what makes you confessional, but you don't actually know the theological, historical content of our confessions or the categories that they're using. And if you crit criticize somebody for using those categories for being too scholastic, like who's the confessionalist here? Um, and and it's, it's strange. It's a kind of, of uh, I think, fundamentalism that and in some ways, actually, the, the critique really sounds a lot like the pietists, the radical pietists, criticizing the Lutheran Orthodox. I mean, the arguments are almost one for one identical th that I've heard with the critiques that the pietists make against the Lutheran Orthodox. And I'm talking about with a more orthodox pietist, but uh, they say, you know, you're too theological. You use all these distinctions. They confuse people. We need to just get back to simple faith. That's the same arguments that these people are using. Anyway, okay. Uh, I'll get out my, my soapbox here. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I know I'm a little heated, but it's like, I mean, these people basically told me I was not qualified to be a pastor because of things I said. Uh, they told me I'm literally Satan, somebody said to me. I mean, it's wild, wild, wild stuff. Uh, I'm about ready to get off of social media these days. <laughs> Okay, so Luther says, 103, I do not wish to have denied by the foregoing that God may have and know still other modes whereby Christ's body can be in a given place. My only purpose was to show what crass fools our fanatics are when they concede only the first circumcised mode of presence to the body of Christ. Circumscribed. It, it, th this is what we mean by local or physical presence. Luther's saying this is crass, this is wrong, this is not what we believed. Although they were unable to prove... Even this mode is contrary to our view, for I do not want to deny in any way that God's power is able to make a body be simultaneously in many places, even in a corporeal and circumcised manner. So he's saying that even if, which is true, I'm not denying that, because we're not coming from the Reformed perspective that says God can't do this. God can if he wants. If he wants to do a, a, make Christ physically present anywhere, God can do whatever the heck he wants. He says, for who wants to try to prove that God is unable to do that? Who has seen the limits of his power? The fanatics may indeed think that God is unable to do it, but who will believe their speculations? How will they establish the truth of that speculation? So he's saying God could do that, but that's not what we're saying. He does in the Lord's Supper. If he wanted to, sure, but we're not given the information to say that that's the case. So we say he is not present in that, in that sense. <laughs> All right, so then we have the commentary actually from the formula of Concord. From these words of Dr. Luther, it is clear in what sense the word spiritual is used in our churches in this matter. And, and here is where we see this distinction between spiritual uh, as it's used by Lutherans and then the Reformed, which is why the formula is just kind of like our, just, people stop using the word spiritual because it's going to be misunderstood. For the sacramentarians think the word spiritual means nothing other than the spiritual communion when true believers are incorporated into Christ the Lord in the spirit and become true members of his body. So what, what the Reformed, and the Reformed are going to continue to say this, and still continue to say this, that this is just some silly debate over the mode of presence. It doesn't really matter because the Reformed believe that we really partake of Christ in some way. 
but when it gets down to the specifics in, in the real question is when I, if I'm presiding over the, the Holy Eucharist in a service and I hand you the body of Christ and I put this in your mouth and I say, this is the body of Christ. Can the Reformed really say, amen, that that thing that you received in your mouth was the actual body of Jesus? The Reform cannot say that. What they can say is, through faith you receive Jesus, who was not actually present on the altar because he can't be, or in the words of Theodore Beza, uh, the, the body of Christ is as, uh, is as distant from the Eucharist as heaven is from earth. Like they're, they're totally separated. So there's some kind of, you know, ascension of my soul spiritually to feed on Jesus, but Jesus is not actually here giving himself to you. And when you do receive Jesus, it's actually faith that's a means of receiving Jesus, not the objective gift in the bread and wine, and that it's only for the elect. Whereas we would say, no, it is objectively on the altar given to you the body and blood of Christ. It's a really significant difference. So the Reformed try to downplay the difference, but it, it should not be downplayed. Okay, so the sacramentarians think the word spiritual means nothing other than the spiritual communion, which true believers are incorporated to Christ and the Lord and his spirit and becomes true spiritual members of his body. When Dr. Luther or we use the word spiritual in this matter, we understand this. The spiritual, supernatural, heavenly way that Christ is present in the Holy Supper. So we're just saying spiritual in that it's supernatural. It's, it's by means of the spirit. But it's, it's a supernatural manner that Christ is present with us and gives us his body and blood. He works not only in only consolation and life in the believing, but also condemnation in the unbelieving. By this, we reject. Here's what we reject. The Capernaidic thoughts and the crude and fleshly presence that is attributed to and forced on our churches by the sacramentarians against our many public protests. So they reject a, a, a fleshly, what we mean is physical. This is why people use the word physical. That's what they're interpreting, saying a physical, fleshly presence. That's not what we're talking about. This is how we want the word spiritually to be understood. When we say that in the Holy Supper, Christ's body and blood are spiritually received, eaten, and drunk. Even though this participation happens with the mouth, the way it happens is spiritual. So the Reformed don't believe that it's a participation by the mouth. Our faith in this article about the true presence of Christ's body and blood in the supper is based on the truth and omnipotence of the true Almighty God, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This foundation is strong and firm enough to strengthen and establish our faith in all temptations about this article. They overthrow and refute all the sacramentarians' counterarguments and objections, however agreeable and plausible they may be to our reason. A Christian heart can rest securely and rely firmly on these truths. All right. I mean, that uh, is... is pretty clear. I think the formula is very clear. It makes exactly the distinctions that I was making. Uh, okay, so there are a ton of places that I can look to now uh, demonstrate that this is indeed the way that Lutherans have interpreted this. Uh, and, you know, I have this giant stack, like I said. I, I will not have time to go through all of them. I mean, I guess I could spend 10 hours talking about this, but... Um, I tend to think that those who were uh, most critical probably wouldn't listen to me anyway, so don't know that it really matters. Um, but for those who do care, <laughs> I do want to show that this is uh, not something that I am making up here. Uh, this is uh, Charles Krauth. Now, if this is put out by Concordia Publishing House, the LCMS Publishing House. Um, this book is has often been very highly recommended. Um, it's, it, it is a wonderful treatment of Lutheran history. It talks about our Lutheran confessions. And uh, in this book, Krauth, Krauth writes this text. Oh, the introduction is by Larry Rast. Who Wasn't Larry Rast the president of Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne? <laughs> like, pretty important guy. Uh, Matt Harrison has recommended this book several times. Todd Wilkins recommended this book several times. Uh, it's pretty standard in the like classics of American Lutheran texts. Uh, Krauth was writing against what was called American Lutheranism of, of Samuel S. Schmucker. Now, American Lutheranism was a supposedly Americanized form of Lutheranism that was not actually really Lutheran at all. It, it denied some of the distinctives of Lutheran doctrine and practice that Lutherans have 
uh, have historically held to, particularly the Lord's Supper. So Krauth was the leader of a group of Lutherans who fought against this this so-called American Lutheranism and tried to identify what was a, a confessionalism. So Krauth is one of the very few people that Francis Pieper, for example, cites consistently, positively, that's outside of the Synodical Conference. Pieper's critical of, like, everybody. <laughs> uh, my favorite theologian is critical of in various ways, and I think unfairly, but but... Even Pieper, in his section on the Lord's Supper, consistently cites Krauth uh, as a great representative of traditional Lutheran doctrine on these issues. So this is written in English. So you can't say that what he says here is just a bad translation. Krauth uses the word physical to talk about corporeal presence which has, again, become Kohler does the same thing and Pieper does the same thing. Others do do this as well. Okay, so I am reading, uh, and this, I guess, is out of print from CPH now, so we're going to be putting out a new edition of this. This is one of my favorite books of all time. Uh, I mean, I'll tell you, this book was so formational for me and my understanding of Lutheranism. Uh, this is one of the first Lutheran books I read. It's huge, but it's one that I revisit constantly. And, you know, people ask me where where I get my theology from or who I align with most uh, theologically, and, and really no one more than Krauth. You know, I cite Gerhard as my, as my favorite theologian, but Gerhard I, I got into later. But if you want to talk about the people who formed, formulated my theology better than anybody else, I mean, Krauth is, is maybe probably number one on that list. So I, I love Krauth. His approach to the Reformation is one that I that I take. And I think if you read this book, you'll start to see like, oh, yeah, like half the things I say are really just repeats of what Krauth says in this book. <laughs> and, and Widener, by the way, Revere Franklin Widener, um, his dogmatics is essentially Krauth's theology. Uh, Widener was a student of Krauth. He was Krauth's most significant student. And a lot of what he writes is really just the notes that he took in Krauth's classes that he then used for his own lecture notes when he taught classes uh, and wrote into books. So when you're reading Widener, in some ways, you're just reading Krauth. Okay. Um, with all of that being said, you know who Krauth is. I'm going to <clears throat> I'm going to start reading some about uh, about this idea of modes of presence. Now, there's a whole section on modes of presence here in Kraut's book. I'm reading on page 651. So this is the, you know, when we put out an edition, it's going to have new typesetting, which means the page numbers won't exactly line up. But uh, you can find this on Google Books for free if you want to read this. This is on page 651 um, on modes of presence. He says, in other words, as our church believes that one essence of God is two modes of presence, one general and ordinary, by which he is present to all creatures, and the other special and extraordinary. By the way, this is this is important because this is a distinction that the Reformed are willing to make too, that we understand that God is, can be present in different ways. And Scripture just testifies to that because on the one hand, in him we live and move and have our being. All things are before the presence of God. That's God's omnipresence. But Scripture also says that God dwells in his people. We're, we're temples. God dwells in our hearts. So clearly there's a difference between the fact that God is present everywhere and that God takes up residence in me or the way that God is present, say, in the temple in Israel. So uh, we recognize this generally. I mean, every theologian has to recognize this, that there are different ways that God can be present. So we're saying, well, we all recognize this. So it's not really that different to say that Christ as God can also have a presence in different ways. Um Okay, let's see. By which it is present so as to constitute one person, after which mode it is present to none other than to the humanity of Jesus Christ, and that both modes of presence, although unlike in their results, are equally substantial. So that's where I get the word substantial presence from. That is, is language that is repeatedly used to say that the substance of the humanity, the essence of what the body and blood are, those are actually present in the sacrament. So does she believe that this one humanity taken into personal and inseparable union with this one essence has two modes of presence. One determinate, which is related to space through its own inherent properties. The other infinite, to which it is related to space in the communion of the divine attributes. And that both modes of presence, though unlike, are equally substantial. So they're the actual substance. So God's essence, you know, we say this about God's essence, it's here with me now, even though I can't, you know, test it. Okay, it is said that to deny Christ's sacramental presence is local, because he's saying we're denying that's local, is to deny it altogether. 
So we're going to reject the idea that it is a local presence. It is often referred to as an illocal presence. Now that it seems confusing, and that's what Krauts is going to try to say. I understand why that would be confusing. Because what, but what we're saying by local is not that it's not really here, but it's not circumscribed in one particular place like an ordinary physical object is. Okay, uh, that to affirm his determinate presence is in the realm of the angels and the glorified is to affirm that he has no presence at all on the earth. But it be it said, but then at least, here this is important, let the odious libel that our church teaches consubstantiation or a physical presence or a corporeal or carnal mode of presence be forever dropped. And this is something you'll continue to see, is that it's regarded as libel. It's a misrepresentation to say that Jesus is physically present in the sacrament. Krauth again, our church never has denied that. In the sense and in the manner in which our Lord was once on earth, he is no longer here. So, it's saying that there's, a, there's clearly a difference between the way that Jesus walked on this earth with the apostles, where like they could, you could stick your hand in a shoulder and feel him, and you could hear his voice. There's clearly a difference in how Jesus was present then and how Jesus is present now. He doesn't, when I say Christ is present in church, I don't see Jesus, you know, sitting in the pew. Clearly there's a difference, but that doesn't mean that he's not present. He's just not present in the same way. Okay, but the church maintains that the illocal is as real as the local. The supernatural is as true as the natural. And, and so he's saying that this is just like the soup. Again, this, this comes down to what I was saying before about our skeptical post-enlightenment context. We tend to think of the supernatural as not being as real as the physical things that we can touch and see. That's not a Christian view of reality. Instead, the supernatural, mystical, these things are just as real as the things that I can actually see, taste, and touch. So just because we don't refer to it as physical or local doesn't mean it's not real or substantial. It is just as real, if not more real, than my physical body being here, that Jesus gives himself to me in the sacrament. Just because it's, it happens in a mysterious or supernatural way doesn't mean it's not real. Okay, now we have a citation of Jacob Andre, who, guess what, is one of the people who wrote the Formula of Concord, the documents here. Uh, this is in his, his argument with Theodore Beza. He says, a local absence does not prevent a sacramental presence. So he's saying absent in one sense, but sacramentally present in another sense. <laughs> So if you want to see the particulars of these distinctions, um, it's actually, th this is published by Concordia Publishing House again. It's, uh, I think it's called just like Lutheranism versus Calvinism, which is, it's the dialogue that happens between Andre and Beza. And you see all of these distinctions spelled out there. Okay, the presence of Christ's humanity on earth through the deity with which it is one person is as real as is its presence through the properties of its own essence in heaven. <laughs> The soundest theologians do not hesitate to declare in propositions which seem contradictory. It's part of our mystery and our theology. Uh, the, but they're not. You see, God is everywhere and God is nowhere. Everywhere in his fathomless omnipresence, nowhere locally or determinately. And as is the presence of the divine, such is the presence it imparts to the humanity which is personally united with it. Okay. Uh, and here is a quote from Chemnitz here. Martin Chemnitz says, There's no contradiction in attributing contrary things to the same subject, provided they be observed in different respects and modes. All right, so there's a, there's some citation from, from Charles Krauth here. Uh, but this is not, you know, only Krauth who is making these distinctions. So let me show you something else. All right, so here is, um, this is Heinrich Schmidt's Doctrinal Theology of the Evangelical Lutheran Church. Um we we put out an edition of this book in new typeset format. This is the the older version, on page five sixty one. So sorry, it's not in the same place in ours. Uh, but but if you look at ours, uh, it's on the section on the sacramental presence. You should be able to find a table of contents. Um, and so uh, Schmid 
this work, if you're not familiar with it, is basically a summary of 17th century Lutheran orthodoxy. Uh, it even goes before that because it starts with, it's basically uh, Martin Chemnitz through David Hollatz, which is the, uh, I think, the, the best era of development of Lutheran theology. It's that immediate post-Reformation era where all of the little particularities of our theology are really hashed out, especially in conversation with the Roman Catholics and Reformed and the Arminians during that era. Okay, uh, now this is, let's see, the quote here is first from, from Gerhard, but he cites, he cites all sorts of people here. Um, so let me just read, read some kind, there's David Hollatz here, who's cited in Quenstedt as well. Okay, so I'm going to read just a few of the things that are mentioned here, because here you're going to get some of the most significant theologians in the entirety of our tradition. Okay, <clears throat> he says, the presence is called sacramental, uh, and here this is a quote from, from Gerhard, because the celestial object in this mystery is bestowed and presented to us through the medium of external sacramental symbols. It is called true and real, which again, these are the terms that I use, they're precise terms that our tradition has used, to exclude the figment of a figurative, imaginary, or representative presence. Substantial, which again is the specific term that I used because it's what's been used by our theologians. It's, it, these are all very carefully chosen terms to exclude the subterfuge of our opponents concerning the merely efficacious presence of the body and blood of Christ in this mystery, mystical, supernatural, and incomprehensible, because in this mystery the body and blood of Christ are present not in a worldly manner, but in a mystical, supernatural, and incomprehensible manner. Okay, so now we get we get to the question of corporeal or physical. These, these are often used interchangeably, but this says corporeal here. Okay. Some of our theologians have called it a corporeal presence, but only with respect to the object, not at all to the mode. They wish to say this, that not only the virtue and efficacy, but the substance itself of the body and blood of Christ is present in the Holy Supper. For they oppose this word to spiritual presence as it is defined by their opponents. Saying spiritual presence is okay, but they're saying it's a real bodily presence in that it's an actual body. And that's what they mean when they're saying corporeal can be used in that sense. But by no means wish to say thereby that the body of Christ is present in a corporeal and quantitative manner. Okay. Um, now I'm going to move on here to Johannes Quenstedt, who says this. The presence, however, the presence of Christ in the Supper is, quote, not physical, local and circumscriptive, such as belongs to natural bodies. Exactly what I said. Uh, okay, but as a, quote, hyperphysical or supernatural, which we cannot recognize by our natural perception. Okay, then David Hollatz uh, distinguishes still further a double method of hyperphysical presence. Definitive presence is that of a being which is present somewhere without the local occupation of space. In this way, angels are present who, because they are spiritual essences, cannot be measured by any interval of space. All right, so there we go. We've got uh, some other theologians. First of all, we have Schmid saying this, uh, and Schmid is interpreting these theologians, but then we have explicit quotes from uh, Gerhard and uh, Quenstedt and then David Hollatz. Uh, you can find it in Kailov as well, um, but he doesn't cite Kailov specifically there. Uh, then we have, there, there's some pretty helpful clarifications in, in Adolf Um uh, I really like Haneke, and he's one I recommend all the time. His Evangelical Lutheran Dogmatics, he was a Wisconsin Synod theologian. Um, I think he's he's in the Synodical Conference tradition just before Pieper. I think he's better than Pieper, um, which I know is maybe a controversial opinion, but <laughs> I, th I think he's more, um, I think he's more careful than Pieper, and he's far more systematic than Pieper is, which I know some people don't like that, but I do. Okay, um, let's see. I'm going to read just a few things that he says here. And these are just helpful clarifying points. I'm not just going to keep reading the same quotes saying the same things of what I just read. But uh, this is his point four on page uh, 126 in volume four of this series, where he says, The eating of the body and drinking of the blood under the bread and wine in the supper is just as much an actual true oral partaking as the partaking of the bread and wine. So he says, for example, he says the partaking, and this is where what's different from the Reformed, okay? So he says the partaking of the heavenly material is thus not a metaphorical, non-literal partaking. It is a literal, true, oral partaking. So it is true. It is, it is literal, even if it's not physical per se, in the way that we're partaking of physical bread and wine. 
And then he has this Martin Chemnitz quote, which is a really great quote, as always, for Martin Chemnitz. If these words of the Supper concerning the bread and, and drink are to be interpreted, understood the way they are meant in John 6, which is what they call the Capernaitic, because he's in Capernaum when he's giving this bread of life discourse, there will be no need for an external material element of bread and wine in the celebration of the Supper. It also follows that Christ did not take material bread or physical wine in the First Supper. For those words of John 6 are meant figuratively. On that point, there is no controversy. The words eat and drink in John 6 are simply metaphorical. The people of Capernaum were seeking an external eating, but Christ interprets the eating simply as faith. But then, it is entirely false for anyone to think that the Lord's Supper can be celebrated without the external elements of bread and wine, in such a manner that the mouth of the body tastes nothing at all in the Lord's Supper. So he's saying that just because it's a kind of it's a heavenly mode by which Christ is present in the Supper to give him give us his body and blood, that doesn't mean there's no need for a physical eating or drinking, That, but that is through the bread and the wine. So God does use the physical act of eating and drinking to give us the body and blood of Christ. Okay, these things, okay. Uh, it is obviously true that the words of John 6 are not a reason for wrestling with the words of inst resting the words of institution for their proper and natural meaning, so those things in the natural sense of institution prescribes a command would have to be either removed or changed. For in John 6, these things are either not reported or not reported in the same way as the institution, nor is it true that the institution of the supper Christ spoke only in an indefinite way about eating his body and drinking his blood. For when he says, take, eat, drink, he wishes and commands that we take with the mouth what he holds before us. Concerning that which is received in this way by mouth, Christ declares, this is my body, this is my blood. From this, it is certain in the sense that the words are proper and natural. So we can say that what we do actually eat physical bread and drink physical wine, that is physical. And in that act, we are receiving the actual body and blood of Christ, though they are present or given to us in a supernatural manner. Okay, so here, um, page 129, uh, he's talking about the mode, uh, the manner of oral partaking. The body and blood of Christ Jesus are certainly received with the bread and wine orally. Yet the manner or mode of receiving them is as different as the body and blood of Christ. The heavenly elements are different from bread and wine, the earthly elements. Hence, the mouth takes the body and blood of Christ in another manner than bread or wine. This is why it's not a physical, you know, chewing like you chew a hamburger. So David Hollatz makes the difference clear in this way. So this is what Hollatz says. Sacramental eating and drinking is a single undivided action in which we simultaneously eat the Eucharistic bread and drink the body of Christ or, and the body of Christ, sorry, sacramentally united with it, and likewise drink from the Eucharistic cup the wine and the blood of the Lord sacramentally united with it. But this one eating and drinking is done in a twofold way. For although the earthly and heavenly elements are taken with one and the same organ, this is not done in the same way. Bread and wine are received with the mouth directly or immediately and in a natural way. The body and blood of Christ are received immediately and in a supernatural way. Uh, and then we have a quote from uh, Johannes Quenstedt, who says this. A distinction is uh, to be made between the eating itself and its essence, definition, and properties on the one hand, and the accidental features and consequences of the eating on the other. It is not valid to conclude from the fact that Christ's body is genuinely eaten, that therefore it is torn apart with the teeth, transferred into the stomach, and digested there in the manner of other foods. So that's what we're saying. We're saying it's not physical. It's not in this way that we receive it. It does not belong to the general essence of genuine eating and drinking that food and drink are ingested into the stomach by means of swallowing, for the aforementioned accidents and consequences pertain only to the natural manner of eating, not to the supernatural. All right. So there's plenty more that, that I could read here. Um, I've got a bunch of other texts set aside, but we're getting close uh, to to our time here at getting close to an hour. So um, I, I hope that this was was helpful for you. Um, again, I know that I don't I don't generally like to make a Twitter spat the topic of my podcasts, and I don't plan on doing that in the future. Um, but because there were accusations from uh, ordained Lutheran pastors toward me as if I'm teaching something novel or heretical or against you know our theological tradition and because it made it onto another podcast uh i felt like it was worth addressing uh because this whole thing blew up uh, so much um i think it just goes to show that uh twitter is not the best place to do theology 
<laughs> it's not. Uh, and, and that's just how things blow up. I think one, one of the things that gets really frustrating about Twitter, too, is like that it's hard to keep your own tweets within your context. So, you know, for example, there was an actual discussion that was going on with, with the particular Roman Catholic guy that I was responding to. And it, it was a scholastic discussion of what physicality is and, and uh, you know, whether that applies to the Lord's Supper. And I'm using these kind of categories that are part of our historic theology. And as Twitter does, this tweet just is randomly out there. And then people start to grab onto it and think that I'm talking in a totally different context. And so I had people talking about how this concerned them about how I preached in the pulpit, that I was, that I'm probably just preaching all of these little scholastic distinctions from the pulpit, uh, or that I'm bringing doubt to people because I'm using language that's too academic or something. You know, it, it's context. Um, it's the context in which people are talking about things. Don't just assume that you know the context in which somebody is talking when you don't, um, <laughs> which people do all the time. And I'm not of the opinion that we need to be hiding things about our theology that are confusing from laity. I really just don't buy that at all. Do I think that our sermons should be just scholastic discourses on, you know, little particularities of our theology? No. Listen to my sermons. I don't do that. <laughs> okay. If you're worried that I do, listen to my sermons. I don't preach like that to a congregation. But but at the same time, I also don't think we need to like hide what our theology is because we're scared of people misinterpreting it. It just explain it. Like like if I if I you know was having this conversation, say if I'm in a Bible study and says and somebody says, uh, do we physically eat the body of Jesus in the supper? Um, it, it's really not that difficult to explain. I'd say, well, you know, I, I think physical is probably not the best word word to use. It's it, we really receive Jesus in the supper. We really partake of his body and blood, his actual body and blood. Um, but we have to distinguish that from like the way that you would, you know, eat a steak. And and it, it's it's a mystery. It's a supernatural way that we receive him. It's not in the same way that you eat ordinary food, but it is a real eating. That's what I'd say. And in in a Bible study, if that ever came up, and. Is it that confusing? Like, I really don't think it is. I, I don't think it is that confusing. I, I think that uh, we we downplay the intellect of the laity. And, and I think people can handle these things. We can explain them in ways that are not that complicated. We don't have to use all of the complicated scholastic terminology. I don't think that's necessary. Uh, but the main ideas are, are fine. I mean, I, I think the congregation would understand pretty well if, say, I'm talking about modes of presence in a sermon. And I say, well, in one way, he's not here. Uh, through his ascension, you know, because we can't see him in, you know, we don't see him and feel him and touch him, but in another way, he is always present with us. Is it really that confusing to preach that? Not really. <laughs> like, uh, not really. Um, you just have to take the time to explain things well. Okay. Uh, well, I hope you found this useful. I didn't know if this would even be worth the time because part of me thought... The people that would need to hear this won't listen to it anyway, and if they do, they'll find something to criticize because that's just what they do. Um, and then the other people may not really care, so <laughs> do, do listen because they wouldn't have come to these conclusions, but I don't know. Anyway, make sure you subscribe uh, on YouTube and on your podcast app, and uh, we'll be getting back to our ordinary series. I've got uh, some exciting things planned in the future going back to our Augsburg Confession series, going back to our Christology series, and I've got a talk on uh, Foucault, which is always lots of fun, planned soon too. So uh, well, we'll see you in the next one. God bless. <laughs>